Hey guys, welcome to this Gold BGG Instructional Advanced Back Control. My name is Rory Van Vliet. This is my training partner, Kevin Wong. Uh, hopefully you have watched the Back Control Basics Instructional here because I'm going to be working off of the understanding that you guys already know that stuff and I'll reference that material once in a while. But this is advanced because we're going to be looking at more lever-based rotational control, playing on the weak side a bit more. We're going to take a look at uh, a little bit more advanced grip fighting, arm traps with our legs, as well as taking a look at the body triangles. So I hope you guys enjoy this. It's going to be a deep dive into some different concepts on back control. So I just want to go over quickly kind of the control scheme of what we're going to be looking at getting into with what we have been calling cross body back control and talk about just the difference of lever based rotational control versus direct rotational control. So. What we're going to be looking at is instead of the direct rotational control of the seat belt that we went over with in the uh, back control basics, we're going to be looking at using levers by having motorcycle grips that we're accessing a lever to the shoulder and accessing the right hip with a twister hooks that we're accessing a strong lever to the hip. And so now I have cross body back control in the sense that I'm controlling the right hip and the left shoulder. And so I still have rotational control in the sense that if, by me having this twister hook, if Kevin tries to turn to his left right now, he can't. But if he tried to turn to his right, I can actually make it a little bit difficult, but he'll still be able to turn that way. The motorcycle grip, being a lever to his left shoulder, if he tries to turn to his right right now, he can't because this arm is gonna end up getting pulled behind him, which is gonna keep his shoulder in place. But if he goes to turn to his left, he's going to be able to. So we have to have both. By having both, I control his ability to turn to his left or his right side. The great thing about lever-based rotational control is that it allows us to move our opponent even if they don't want to. With direct rotational control, I can stop my opponent from being able to move. So if he tries to turn to his left or his right, I can stop him. But my ability to move Kevin right now is extremely difficult because I got nothing to really move them with. We are able to make slight adjustments of our hip just to be able to change the angles of our base in relation to each other, but I don't have the ability to really move them. With levers, if Kevin, don't let me move you right now, Kevin. By me having levers, I'm gonna be able to move them around all over the place against his will. Lever-based rotational control is more advanced because there's more nuances to the, the placements of our, the positioning of our hands and how we control it. And there's gonna be a lot more kind of troubleshooting or just possible space that our opponent has to be able to defend the positions versus say uh, direct rotational control. Another example would be say side control, basic side control, chest to chest connection. Now I have some, even if it's super poor, I have some direct rotational control. Kevin tries to turn to his left or his right. I've got him pinned to an extent. But if I tried to move him right now with just my chest to his chest, it's extremely difficult to do so. That's where we look at a cross face that I'm accessing a lever on his chin so that even if he doesn't want to turn, I'll turn him. Or a better example would be the Kimura, where now if he tries to turn to his left or right, he can't. But now don't allow me to turn you, Kevin. Doesn't matter. But look at the space that's been created here and the ability now for Kevin to be able to start hand fighting. And if he manages to get rid of, say, this lever control, the hand on the wrist, as soon as that's gone, now he escapes the position. And because there's the space, his leg comes inside here. He's able to immediately get back to guard. Versus, say, this direct rotational control. Well, because I'm so tight the whole time, even if he tries to escape right now, there's not a lot of room for him to work with. And I have a lot of time to respond. So lever-based rotational control is stronger. Because it's more effective, we're going to be able to move our opponent against their will. It's also more efficient because by having a lever, it becomes a multiplier of force. So my, the same output of force that I generate now goes further. And so it's not going to take me as much energy to be able to hold some of these positions against uh, your opponent. But there are going to be some room for failure. So I'm going to just show you guys a little bit more on the troubleshooting of this crossbody back control and what we're able to do with it. And I think you guys are really gonna enjoy it. 
So as I talked about, there's two main parts of this crossbody back control, the motorcycle grip and the twister hook. I'm going to have a separate video for each one of these to just kind of go over the finer points of the detail and how you guys can control it. So the first one is going to be talking about the motorcycle grip. <clears throat> motorcycle grip, the arm that is underneath coming out from underneath the, your partner's armpit, it's going to be grabbing onto the wrist. So we would usually be starting with, say, direct rotational control, the seat belt and then migrating to the hand, or you can be just jumping straight into the lever base control by going straight to the motorcycle grip. If we can grab the hand, the, the fat uh, part of the pinky here on the hand, so like the meaty drumstick part, this is gonna be really strong control because it allows me to start breaking the structure further of Kevin's arm because I can now manipulate the wrist and this is gonna be still the further end of the lever. So when it comes to the hand fighting aspects as well, very strong. However, depending on how Kevin's defending the position here, like, uh, has his hands up defending, this hand might be kind of covering his hand. And so we want to be always looking at at least being able to control very comfortably with the wrist or even a little bit down the forearm. But the higher up to the wrist and to the hand, the stronger the lever, the better control we're going to have. Now, what he's looking to do is be able to break this control. One of the main ways that people will break this control is by punching their arm straight down. Now this really only works if your opponent has extra length, so their arm is much longer than yours, or in this case, Kevin's stronger than me, and so he's going to be able to, my fingers get weaker and weaker, as he punches his arm down, my hand starts sliding further up his forearm, so my lever control becomes weaker and weaker, and then he breaks that grip. If I got the hand, this is already going to be much harder for Kevin to do. And another thing that we can look to do is a slight internal rotation of our wrist. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be controlling his wrist. I'm doing this with no thumb because if I do it with a thumb, the, the only purpose of this is if I want to actually encourage the push. I want to be able to shove his hand down, especially if we're looking at certain grip fighting schemes. But I'm looking to grab with no thumb here because what I want to do is I want to be able to encompass 360 degrees around Kevin's arm. My hand is resting on top of his forearm, as you can see from the camera angle, so it stops Kevin from being able to push his arm out this way. He can't go up because my forearm's sitting here, and he also doesn't have much range of motion. He can't go backwards because it would be going into his chest, and so down is the only way he can go. I'm going to try and have my fingers, four fingers, and the hand, as much as possible, wrapped over, covering this, so it's going to be difficult for him to go. Then, I'm going to internally rotate my wrist slightly, turning my thumb in, and trying to get a bit of movement off of his elbow here, like this. I am not lifting my elbow, I'm not internally rotating my elbow, I'm just internally rotating my wrist, and the little bit of movement that I put through my wrist, accessing the lever to his arm, is going to invoke a bigger movement out of his arm. And so I'm going to get just a slight movement of his elbow here. By me having this, it helps me also take my thumb, the drumstick part of my thumb and hand, to really start pushing his hand into his chest here, add some more friction. And now, as Kevin tries to extend his arm, even if I'm down at the wrist here, I'm going to have better control. He's driving a lot more force here into my knuckles now because of how I've also turned my hand rather than being here where my, you can see because of the angle of my hand, my pinky and my ring finger are actually holding on a lot more and those are weaker. Here as I turn, I can start to incorporate and share all the force equally spread out across my four fingers as well as making them slightly weaker by just a slight internal rotation of his shoulder opening up his elbow. Now, if we start to lose the control, we need to have something control on the left side of his body at all times because we're going to have this twister hook on this side. As soon as I start to lose the left side of his body, there's going to be problems. If he starts to break this grip, this hand is going to reach over to the back of his elbow. It can even sometimes be to his forearm. It's going to be kind of whatever you can grip here. As long as there is a access to his shoulder, in some way, whether it's through this lever or even going all the way just to the shoulder itself, I'm going to be able to at least control him. I'm going to basically form a, a figure four grip like a Kimura, except it's at his elbow here. So as soon as this grip starts to get broken, I grip the back of his tricep, I grip up on my forearm here, and I keep everything nice and tight. I'm shrugging my shoulder into his head. I'm making sure I'm keeping my head on this side. Because if I lose the control here, 
I'm going to start losing the entire position. Here, now, I might be able to start migrating my hand down to his wrist kind of like a Kimura and getting my hand back. Or I'm going to have to look at taking this arm and clearing it across to be able to drive his head off to the side to get more access here so that I can migrate my hand down to his wrist like a Kimura to get in that motorcycle control back and coming back here. Here, breaking this grip, I can even reach across already and get this control. And so I can't, even a, a traditional Kimura, I can't really get that because his wrist is so low here. So I'm just going to check here at the elbow. So it's going to be the first lever, elbow to shoulder, rather than going elbow to wrist. Here. Now if Kevin tries to turn to his right, I still got it. This form is pulling into his shoulder, as well as this hand is accessing that lever of the elbow. Now from here as he's fighting this, I'm able to, if his hand keeps staying over here, then I can either look to switch back when I feel comfortable and getting into uh, going right into the chokes because this hand's not here. And then as this hand comes back to turn the fend, I can get that grip. Or we can look to keep adjusting angles and looking to adjust to the Kimura grip to then adjust back to that motorcycle grip here. But it should be very hard for your opponent to be able to punch that arm out because of our lever control as well as the slight internal rotation of our wrist. So make sure you feel comfortable with that motorcycle control. You can have just a single, you can have a double, you can even be motorcycle gripping to an extent with the other arm if you needed to. Uh, a lot of different ways of controlling that lever. Very strong, very hard for our opponent to escape from that because naturally we're on their back and they don't have a lot of options. All right, looking at the twister hook. So normally our hooks in back control just rest here against our opponent's hips. So it's more direct rotational control. And even if they start to slide down to the knees a little bit, it's very weak control because I'm not actually doing much to control the lever. And because my knees typically start to get kind of open out to the side with external rotation to the hips, it's not very strong. What we're looking at doing is having one of our legs, and you can see how even just from here, there's a slight shift of my hips to Kevin's hips. So instead of being right, uh, my hips pressed against the small of his back, I can turn slightly off to the side here to create the angle that I'm able to now extend my leg all the way through. So now, what I'm looking at doing is accessing the lever down at his ankle, or it could sometimes be up at his calf. Obviously, the length of you and your opponent is going to be kind of dictating that. Being six foot five, I can always get down to somebody's ankle, but mid-calf is totally fine. What I'm looking at doing here is keeping my uh, knee kind of pointed straight up, like I can open it up a bit here. I'm pointing my toes up to the sky, I'm looking at leg pressing and extending my legs so that my hamstring is pushing down into his hip while I'm lifting my heel off the mat and causing this extreme external rotation of his hip here. So you can see how instead of here where say Kevin has both his feet planted on the mat and he can be in strong alignment here, I am hooking here and extending my leg out and now you can see how my knee is now in a nice strong alignment to my ankle and to my hip and Kevin's alignment of his leg is very weak, so the structure becomes broken. If Kevin tries to move his leg here, I should be able to put in enough pressure that it becomes very difficult. If I just have this grip but I don't lift my heel off the mat, or I'm not trying to, you won't always necessarily lift your heel off the mat, but if I'm not thinking about always creating that tension here, Kevin's gonna be able to relieve the tension by just kicking up that direction. So I wanna maximize his uh, limit at this direction so that I've already taken him to his furthest point, so he can't. And I'm also really stuck to him, so I'm curling my toes, hooking here. If, when we're going through this, as I'm going to show you guys really shortly here, to be able to generate momentum and kick our opponent, we're going to sometimes just be off to the side here, which is what makes this position so strong, is that I can actually start to lose connection to my opponent's back and still be able to recover from here. I can't do the same thing of opening my knee up and pointing it up and always having my toes pointing straight up because it's actually quite weak when I'm more on the bottom here, where I'm behind my opponent. If I'm here, what I'm looking at doing is turning my knee in to his hip. So that's going to be the point carrying that, uh, the anchor to his hip. And my toes are going to be curling, but they're actually going to be pointing off to the side here. And what I'm looking at doing is turning that knee in, hooking here, and looking at extending them out this direction. 
You can see this is what starts to create this momentum that starts to turn his hips the other way, which is going to allow us to use a chair set reset on the weak side. So if we're here with my opponent kind of relatively on top of me, I'm looking to turn my knee in, point my toes to the side, and create that pressure because there's a, uh, a switch in his hip angle now. Now his hips are pointing out this direction. However, same thing now, if I've reset and we're sitting more up here, his hips are no longer pointing off to this direction, they're pointing up this direction. And because of the, the change of our position, my knee, if I was to try and turn my knee in like this, it'd be uncomfortable and it'd be weak. Where now Kevin just kicks the leg out. Now I turn my knee outwards and I keep this hook here for the twister hook. So it's just being mindful of how you're placed relative with your positioning to your opponent's body set, you're going to be able to maximize the uh, effectiveness of this twister hook. There will also be times where we are unable to get this twister hook completely, whether he's already got his leg further away or because of the hip angle, where I'm going to at least make sure that I am curling my leg in and I'm going to be accessing the lever from the knee to the hip rather than trying to get up at the ankle. So we're unable to get this. There's going to be hip adjustments we can make to get it, but making sure that we're accessing this part as a lever still, because I'm going to be still able to make some good things happen with this, which I'm going to talk about in the hip shuffle movement. So, very different leg work. We're unable to have, uh, unless there was like some massive height difference, able to have twister hooks on both sides. That's not going to be possible. So it's all right to have a slight adjustment of your hip to make sure that you're able to get that hook in. And we're going to go over some other troubleshooting later on making sure that you're always able to adjust and keep that twister hook. So two things that we want to be thinking about constantly when we're trying to reset the back control positions is how do we generate momentum so that we can generate a push pull so that we can use our opponent's energy against themselves as well as creating mobility in our hips so that we can facilitate that as well as making sure that we're creating angles so that we're not using flexibility. It's really easy to get caught up in the mindset of thinking that flexibility is the answer to all your problems and if I can't get the twister hook from a certain position then that must mean that I need more flexibility. That's not the answer. Flexibility is an attribute like strength. It can supplement your technique but it should not be a substitute for your technique. So. Anytime you feel in any position in Jiu Jitsu, if you feel you need flexibility to get the job done, it's either a bad technique or it's you're just one hip angle adjustment or two away from being in the right position to be able to do it more effectively. So what we're going to look at doing here is basically a Kazushi where we're going to be looking at kicking our opponent to one side, generating momentum so that then we can wind that up to pull them to the other side, which is what the next video will be going over with the chair sit. Here, I got weak side control. I'm starting to lose the position. So I'm shedding that hook so that I'm able to make sure I got the twister hook here. I'm able to put the twister hook in relatively early because of my length. But if we we're in this position and I was unable to get the hook here because of whether it's how Kevin's like, Kevin's keeping his knee in nice and tight, he might even not have nice knee elbow connection here, and I might have a hard time getting here. What I'm going to look to do is mobilize my hips by having my left leg, bottom leg here, planted in base with my toes, so that I'm going to be able to shift my angle and actually start disconnecting, so that now I'm going to be able to start hooking here. So from this angle where my hips are parallel on the same plane as Kevin's, it's very difficult for me to be able to necessarily get here. My length almost actually works against me because I can't get to this little stub of a leg that Kevin has. But as I adjust my hip angle, I'm no longer having my toes pointing upwards. I now have my toes pointing down, which allows me now a lot more mobility to be able to catch his leg and to be able to hook here. And if I still can't hook at his ankle, I at least have the ability to really curl strong into his leg here to be able to perform the other movements. With this lever-based control, I'm able to, what we stress as importance in the first back control, back control basics, my chest has to always be connected to his back. That is always a good idea. However, with the lever, 
I am able to really get disconnected off to the side from Kevin and still be able to come back from this because of the force that I can generate and the movement that I can invoke in my opponent. Basically, as, until he gets perpendicular here where his shoulder is perpendicular to my chest, where now he's going to be able to start getting his arm to the other side, or having the front of his shoulder start dipping into me, where now it's going to be really hard for me to get past this angle to get back to the back. As long as I'm even right here, where I'm just behind his delt, his rotator cuff like this, if he tried to turn into me from here, it's going to be very difficult and I'm still going to be able to use this lever to pull him back in. That will give us more freedom to create mobility as well as momentum. So what we're going to look to do here, I take this leg out if I need to, so that I can use this to access the lever so I can point my toes up and I'm going to put pressure into his ankle and start moving him this way. So I'm keeping my leg basically locked out as I'm just swinging it like a pendulum here to the side. The goal is to keep him from putting the, his back and his hips completely to the mat. If he does, not the end of the world, we're just going to look to start using this hook to move him to this side. And if he starts to get to a point where I have a hard time getting this, then I either adjust so that I can get the hook, or we start to create momentum the other way. So I'm going to curl into his knee here and look to start pulling him this direction. Creating a pull here, and if Kevin starts to fight against this by pushing away from me, I have the ability to start generating force this direction. So, the main direction that we always try and take them is to the weak side further, I'm trying to belly them down, which is the Khabib, which we have a video dedicated to. But I'm just going to kick them this direction to lift him up. Now from here as he pushes back against me, this is where I would use that momentum against his will to take him to the other side. So make sure we're keeping his hook. If he's fighting against this, if he's starting to get his back to the mat, we can either look to use the lever to move his hips or create mobility in our hips so that we can make sure we can maintain this hook to maintain effective lever control. I just want you guys to kind of understand that because it's going to be the basis of the next few techniques that we go over. Alright, so the first movement we're going to look at is the chair sit. So the great thing about this cross body back controller, at least use, utilizing the motorcycle grip, is that we're now able to perform a chair sit motion on the weak side. In back control basics, I showed you guys how to reset the back with a chair sit on the strong side. Not really an option without lever-based rotational control on the weak side. So this will really help round out your game, even if you're just using this for uh, the aspect of being able to just reset the back. So I have the weak side control. I can have just a regular motorcycle grip. I might have a motorcycle grip where my right hand comes over top, and I have control here. Or I could have double motorcycle control. What I'm going to look to do is whether I want to attack the strong side because that's just what I prefer and we can use this to just move ourselves over or more commonly our partner is able to start shedding one leg off and they're starting to get their hips and their shoulders turned away what I need to do is recognize that I don't want my leg underneath my opponent because it ends up he can use his hips to trap my leg here and it's going to be affecting me a lot of answers we can do from here because his hips are so close to us but what I want you guys to actually do is clear your leg out completely, which feels completely against what you're usually taught. But because we have the motorcycle control, because I have the twister hook, and by having my hips out here, it's going to allow me a lot more hip mobility like I talked about to get this twister hook and maintain it effectively, I'm going to have the ability to recover from here. What we're going to look to do is cause that Kazushi of redirecting our opponent off to the side to expose the space underneath the back of his hips and his shoulders because it's going to be very hard for me to pull Kevin from here. So what I'm going to look to do is create that Kazushi motion by kicking his leg out this way. So here I'm going to do it with the extension. I don't have to do it with just the, my leg can kind of be extended where I push down and curve up, or I can do it by extending my leg out this direction. My toes are in base, and I'm going to look to, to move them as much as possible, 
I want to take away his ability to basically increase his lateral profile by taking his elbow and putting it out to the side here. If Kevin can put his elbow out really wide here, it's going to be very difficult for me to move him. Double motorcycle control allows me to use a two-on-one control where both my arms can overpower him and pull it in so that his elbow is really close to his body. So that now if he tries to put his elbow out in base, he can't. So that then when I start kicking him, I'm able to turn him as much as I want. Now, it's not uncommon for people to not want to get belly down because it's about the worst position you can be in in a fight. So Kevin is either going to be planting his foot in base or his hand in base. As I start driving here, as he starts to resist this, it makes sense for me now to use his energy against him. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring this knee up so I'm forming a knee elbow connection, like a chair sit. I'm not gonna be able to get as high as I normally would on a traditional chair sit. But now from here, I'm gonna sit down to my hip, pulling his hips on top of me, and I'm gonna kick his leg downwards like this. I can sit up with him if I'd like to, I usually prefer to try to because it gives me the ability now to generate a lot more base and hip mobility, but it's absolutely fine staying on your shoulders. From here, we're just looking to start, we can either kind of play the cross body position in which I'm going to be twisting my partner's spine, which is what makes the cross body a really strong position. I'm able to keep his right hip pinned and by pulling and accessing the lever to his left shoulder, I can actually start to twist his shoulders into a different plane of direction than his hips which creates a massive twist in the spine, breaking his posture, weakening his alignment. And from here, I'm going to be able to start looking at just getting into a rear naked choke. We'll go over that in a bit. Or just sitting at the strong side, posted on your elbow, everything I went over in back control basics. So from here, I have the weak side control. He starts to get rid of this hook and he's getting his hip on top of it. So I'm just going to free it out. It's very easy for me to always get this leg out because I'm just going to be kind of leg pressing it out. From here, I'm keeping double motorcycle control. I got the twister hook in base. I'm going to cause the Kazushi by redirecting them so I can generate momentum. Look how that lifts them up and I'm lifting my hips up. From here, whether I, always, I, always, uh, I want to go this direction already or he's pushing against me, bringing my knee up so I'm underneath the small of his back at least. So that now it creates a fulcrum, and as I turn to this side, he lands on top of me. Because I have momentum with this, and he's on top of me, I'm going to push with this hook, keeping a lot of pressure here, and use it to pull him to this direction. From here, what I normally do is I start immediately creating this twist and going into the choke. Because his posture is so broken, even though he's grabbing onto this hand right now, I'm in alignment, he is not. Overpowering him here is much easier. Or we land on this side, I put my other hook in, and I get my seatbelt control, and now I'm posted on my elbow. So just a faster kind of pace here. As he starts to get to this side and drive him away, I can start looking for that rear naked choke as I'm transitioning. Because as soon as we land on one side and kind of uh, become stagnant for a moment, solidify that position. Then our partner's mind starts to shift into, well, it's time to start defending this one position. It's always best if you have it in your game to attack submissions during these transitions when your opponent is not thinking about it or even possibly disoriented. So this is a great way of resetting back control with the chair sit on the weak side. And I'm going to show you guys another option of using a hip shovel rather than having to go through that massive movement in the next video. So another alternative that we can use to the chair set reset with the cross body back control is just a hip shovel. The hip shovel we can use either because it's more efficient in some ways, and if our opponent's hips are really close to us and we're responding at an early enough stage, this is a simple solution. It can also be a solution if you don't feel confident with your twister hook yet or depending on the size or length or strength of your opponent that maybe you don't feel very comfortable being able to actually get the twister hook. With that being said, I think by just learning to adjust your hip angle, you're going to be able to solve that problem. But especially when you're first developing this, you might not feel confident to be able to get that twister hook every time. Kevin's hips are always going to be attached to me. 
even if I got the, the twister hook and we've created a slight angle where now I've shifted from right here to a little bit off to his right side, as long as his hips are close to mine, it's quite easy for me to manipulate his center of gravity. So as we're here in this position, Kevin manages to get this leg off and we start to get here. If he's still relatively close to me, I'm going to be able to access this leg as a lever and be able to pull him over the top with a hip shovel. What I'm going to do is actually ditch the twister hook if I'm choosing to do this movement because what I'm looking at doing is actually increasing my ability to create this curl here so that I'm going to be able to put my leg in base and just perform a hip shovel movement where I'm not moving him to the other side but just lifting him up so that I can move my hips to the other side. This is why this is also really effective that if I feel like I can't get this control like he's got tight knee elbow connection and you're just like, oh man, I can't get this. What we're looking at doing is curling our leg into his hamstring and opening my knee up into the inside of his knee to make sure that we're at the end of the lever. What I'm going to do, I can either keep my leg here or you can even plant it on the mat if you want to. Depending on wherever you feel comfortable, this is going to give me some base and close off any angles of him being able to move. And what I'm looking at doing is bringing this knee up as much as I can. By being able to do this, I'm going to be now able to create two different points where I am now accessing the lever to the hip, and I am also have the ability to start lifting the hip up by turning my knee here. And we can see how I can lift Kevin up even though he's slightly off to the side, because I have the ability to create this scissor-like motion. Now I'm not taking this lever and trying to do this, even though it's going to be relatively easy to do if my opponent's relatively the same size, but I'm just lifting him up and hipping out to the other side. Now that this hip angle has changed, my twister hook becomes right here. I'll put that back in. I can either twist them to the side here and immediately start looking for this rear naked choke, or we solidify the strong side again. So here, Kevin manages to get that control back. I might not even have my leg across yet. I can still have my leg on the other side of his body and still be able to, from here, very similar to like how we reset the side uh, when we were forcing sides in back control basics, be able to start just accessing this lever and turning the knee up. It basically becomes the same motion where as this starts to get shed the control, planting my leg and driving here. That's a hip shovel. The only difference here from that back control basics is that this leg starts to get killed completely. And so now we want to have this option of being able to bring the control here. We're looking to access this leg as a lever, planting our leg in the base as much as we can so that we can start bringing the knee up to lift our opponent's hips up slightly. From here, if we needed to, you can absolutely try and use this hook to lift them a bit. You might not feel like you can move them too much. And so being able to bring this knee underneath and lift as much as you can to be able to create this motion where I can lift his hips and move to the side can be a great option. I personally will almost always use this twister hook because I've gotten very confident with it. With my length I can always get it. But accessing the lever of the knee to the hip rather than the ankle to the knee here in base as much as you can. If you can't lift the knee up too much, that's fine. We're just going to place this knee tight to his hip. So that's going to create a, a fulcrum to any extent. Because if I just try and pull him here, there's nothing for him to lift up and over as a pivot point. But here, if I can't get my knee up really high, I just bring it here. And from here at least now when I curl, see how his hip lifts and my knee comes underneath. From here, if I can't lift him any further, I just bring my knee through, start planting my toes into the mat, and create that hip adjustment. Just like a teeter-totter-like effect, place something as a fulcrum, a pivot point. Think about like your knee like a rock, you're just placing it underneath so that you're now able to tilt the board over to the other side, and as you create that space, you keep moving through to the other side, and you're going to be able to reset the back control there. So, relatively easy movement, very small. Just make sure that you're following the steps of the lever base rotation control and trying to find a way to create a fulcrum and you're going to find success with it. This technique we call the Khabib after Khabib Nurmagomedov, 
um, just smashing your opponent, flattening them out, belly down, and then from there, either looking to go for a rear naked choke, or obviously it's a very great position to be in dominant, especially if there was striking involved. And so, basically, it's the first Kazushi motion that we do to set up our chair sit or even the hip shovel, except we're just gonna keep taking our opponent over. So I have the cross body control. I choose to either take the hook out and let my opponent start moving this direction, or they're already getting here. And what I'm gonna do is, Get the double motorcycle grip so that I can take away his ability to increase his base. And I'm going to look to just take this leg, how we've been doing, and extend it outwards, basing up on my toes. Even if he plants his foot here, he's strong until I start shifting my hip angle and driving him down on the shoulder here and flattening him out. So, go from this angle here. He's going to be able to generate base to stop me from pushing him over if my hips stay low. So if I start driving him here and he plants his leg in base, here, don't let me drive you over. I can't drive him over from here because I'm trying to extend him to the side that he's got uh, a post, the angle that he's going to post. He doesn't have anything posted here at the shoulder. So watch as he's posting, he's not letting me turn him. As I start lifting myself, I start putting my head into contact with the mat. I'm going to start putting, increasing the pressure behind this shoulder here to flatten them out. What I'm looking to do is from here, release my hand, post my hand into base, and start driving my knee down to the ground while I'm keeping the twister hook as much as I can, like this, and then rolling my elbow to my knee pulling his arm behind him. If I'm able to even pull his arm back and start handcuffing him, that would be great. But it's not going to happen against anyone good. So here, driving, he's posting against this. I can keep double motorcycle control the whole time if I want, but because his elbow is braced against the floor, I can take that away. Start looking to post this on the mat. Shifting my hip angle here. I'm up on this leg to generate base. If Kevin tries to turn back into me, it's going to be very difficult because of his motorcycle control. And if he tries to keep turning away from me, he can't because of the twister hook. What I'm looking to do here is increase the pressure at his shoulder by pulling this. I can even drop my hip down into him here. And so this is where we call it the Khabib, being able to just rain down on your opponent or being able to drop down here and obviously look to finish the rear naked choke. A bigger response that will happen with this, which sets up the choke at a slightly earlier stage, is that Kevin's leg posted in the mat is not strong enough to stop me. He's going to post his hand on the mat to stop me from being able to drive his shoulders flat. So as we're here, and I start to, we'll just chase in slightly, and I start to drive him over, he posts his hand, his right hand on the mat, because this arm obviously can't. As this happens, I'm going to try flattening him out, it's going to be a bit harder. But both his hands are involved with something, and so as he stops me, I immediately go into the choke. I can look to either continue to try and belly him down here and finish the choke with one arm, or with this motion I can start to look at the reset, where I bring my knee up higher here, bring the knee up to the elbow to clear it like I talked about in back control basics, to then Finish that rear naked choke. So as I drive Kevin over, he posts his arm in the base here. I can either just sometimes get right into the choke easily by firing my arm through, armpit deep, and curling around as I talked about in back control basics, or as I also talked about in that instructional, the arrow head, where from here I just keep my head tight, I'll dig under the chin, get this grip. Now I keep the motorcycle control, I keep the twister hook, I continue to push myself up, lifting my hips. I bring my knee up by my elbow in the chair sit. I bring him to this side. From here, I can either look to finish with a one arm rear naked choke, which I'm going to go over at the end of the instructional, or bring the arm out, finish with a classic rear naked choke. So I don't typically belly guys down and keep them bellied down. I like to just threaten the, the Khabib to try and belly them down to get that response of them posting their hand. Uh, with my lanky body type, I really like kind of staying free 
more on the bottom and being able to use my legs to work. But I know some of the guys in our gym that really enjoy just flattening them out, whether it's for MMA context or obviously being able to dig the choke at that point by having gravity on our side, being able to flatten our opponent out in their horrible alignment of them being spread out across the floor and then smearing them into the mat further with gravity. Very strong position and it's a hell of a position to try and escape from. People will try everything to stop themselves from getting belly down when they are in the bad position of back control. So you're going to create some really big responses and you guys are going to have a lot of success with it. All right, everyone. So this video is going to be dedicated to the body triangle. Body triangle is, a, is one of the best ways of controlling our opponent and stopping them from being able to move. It is direct rotational control. So as we talked about with cross body rotational control, we were looking at levers so that we're going to be able to move our opponent around. Body triangle, we're not moving. We're unable to move very much while we have it, but we also stop our opponent from being able to move at all. It's very strong. The reason why I didn't want to teach it for the uh, back control basics is one, not everybody can do it. There's going to be a certain level of flexibility or limb length that is possibly necessary. Even with me being six foot five, uh, 197.5 centimeters, depending on how big my uh, opponent is, if they have like a big belly, uh, it might be one of the uh, older, bigger guy, I can't put a body triangle on. So it's going to be kind of reliant on the body types and what your physical capabilities are. And there's also, can, there's a strong side and a weak side, but sets us up to be vulnerable on the weak side to a, uh, a leg attack that ends up creating vulnerability in our knee. So the body triangle is especially strong on the weak side because of just the uh, mobility that I have in my upper body and the ability to start looking at gi chokes and moving into kimuras. Whether we're using our hooks or we had cross body back control, we're going to have to get rid of the cross body back control, bring our foot onto our hip, onto our opponent's hip, so we can adjust our hip angle. Hard part of this is if I'm completely parallel with my chest and spine to Kevin's spine, even for me, this is going to be difficult and we never, just like a regular triangle choke, never cross over top of our feet because you can see how my ankle's exposed and now the structure of my ankle is vulnerable and putting a lot of stress into the joint. We want to always be able to go straight over the shin. I need to create a hip angle for that. I'm going to bring my foot up onto his hip. It can be toes in, toes out, your choice. And I'm going to look to just create a little bit of a hip angle here. So I'm going to look to push him down and pull myself out. This is where motorcycle control is great because as we talked about direct rotational control, I need to keep a strong chest to back connection, but I'm able to start losing that control if I have the motorcycle grip here. I'm looking to create a bit of an angle here. I can even go Kimura if you know how. And I'm going to bring my leg across his hip all the way. And the back control basics, I talked about just the, having the foot here or crossing your feet here over the cross leg. This is starting to create that cross body back control in a different way. I don't have the lever on, my, on the hip, but I still have the right corner and the left corner of his body control. The strongest point from here though would be shifting into the body triangle. So once I've got enough of the hip angle here and I got my leg all the way across, I'm going to be taking my ankle and covering it. So I'm basically trying to cover the shin, my actual shins so that there's no joint involved in here as a weakest link over the crook of my knee. And I'm curling my toes up like this, nice and strong. This is creating a bar across Kevin's hips. So now if he tried to turn either side, no way he's going anywhere. Very strong for me now to be able to start looking at digging for the choke. Doesn't give me a lot of mobility for anything else. So it's one of those things that I'll sometimes go body triangle. I'll sit here and then if I'm starting to get something and he's starting to get his hands back involved, then maybe I want the hip adjustment so I can start bringing my legs up and over so that I'm going to be able to trap his arms and be able to shift my angles or attack arm bars. But the body triangle is going to be very strong to hold on to if I start to get into the rear naked choke or try and finish like a collar choke from this position. Now, this is the strong side. My knee is on the ground on the side, so I'm on my left hip, my left knee is here. The connection of the body triangle is up pointed towards the sky. This is important for the leg threat, leg attack threat, but it's also important for the sense that I can open this up whenever I wanted to. So like I talked about, there's times where this is really good for holding on to our opponent, but if we want to start creating mobility in our hips to change up our attacks, I want to be able to choose to open this anytime I want to. 
if I have this side and he moves to the other side and I keep his body triangle locked, one, there's a potential leg lock where, do you even know how to do this leg lock? Where he would step over top of my ankle with his right leg like this and if he starts to bridge into me right now, my foot starts to create a lot of pressure here but it can't go anywhere. And so, let's turn. As it keeps bridging, it starts to externally rotate my hip here. It hurts my ankle. It starts to get a bit of a pull here in the knee. It's quite an embarrassing submission to get caught in because we're in such a strong position to begin with. Let's just down. The bigger problem, I mean, that's still a big, big problem too. But here, now Kevin's weight starts to land on top of my leg. And now my left leg that is creating the body triangle is pinned against his hip and this leg is pinned underneath his hip and so my ability to open this is why it's really hard to defend this leg entanglement as well when he starts going for the leg lock is that I, I can't open my legs up and so now I become kind of stuck here and I can absolutely keep working for the choke and in a street fight situation if Kevin's trying to go for this leg lock and even if he's got it and he's starting to apply it I have the ability to still finish this choke and if it means me taking a slight pop in my knee but me choking him unconscious, I'm gonna win that. So we don't like this leg lock because it's not like a very high level threat. It's just something to certainly watch out for. But we wanna be aware of this pin so that we can switch our body triangle to the strong side. And so what we're gonna to look to do from here is as we got a body triangle on the strong side, as our opponent starts to drive themselves to the other side, we recognize this, we got lots of time to respond. We're gonna undo this, bring our feet to our opponent's hips, or keep the hook, and then as he starts to drive to the other side, feet to the hip, adjust our hip angle to this side. And so this is a really important drill where your opponent's just gonna keep driving to one side. Here, I open it up, I switch my hips, here. You might need to, like I said, bring your feet more to the hooks for a moment. As you start bringing it to the side, feet to the hip, adjust your hip angle, bring the leg across. Here, as he switches to the other side, regular hooks, feet to the hip, adjust, here. As you get more flexible or more comfortable with it, I don't actually really touch his hips at all here. I'll just be here and as he brings himself to the other side, I'll just switch. And then as he goes to the other side, basically as soon as we start to get pointed straight up, it's now going to be a downhill direction for him to the other side. I switch the legs. If he tries to drive to the other side and he doesn't get all the way pointed straight up, I'm just going to keep it and I'm going to just adjust my hip angle. He might even try and drive a little bit. I might even just let go and I'll adjust that angle. Don't allow your opponent to just drive you over. It's very simple that here he, let, he starts driving, post that leg in base, hip back out, pull myself away. Because instead of trying to drive into Kevin, if Kevin drives into me, it's difficult. Two legs versus one. But I just adjust the angle and put the body triangle back in. So. Look to just work that adjustment to keep correcting the angle of the body triangle as well as switching to the strong side. I love the body triangle, very strong form of control, but once again, not for everybody. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on it uh, as in putting multiple videos for it. So if you had an interest in this, hopefully this started to give you some tips to understand how to utilize this more effectively. And if you guys got any more questions, then hit me up in the comments about the body triangle and I'll try and get to them as soon as I can. Alright, so we're going to be looking at some more advanced grip fighting now, getting to the straight jacket. And so this is, like, if you have not watched the back control basics, you really need to watch the grip fighting in order to understand the first part of this, because I'm not going to go through all that. I'm going to assume that you guys have watched it and you're already experts at it. So here, we're on the weak side. I usually like the body triangle if I'm on the weak side. What we talked about was the configuration where he is blocking this grip. We're gonna to switch to a double motorcycle grip to kill this arm. We're gonna take this hand and we're going to peel it off and we're gonna trap it so that we're able to start utilizing the dig. Now, like I said, we have covered 360 degrees around this arm. I talked about that in the other instructional. The only way that I have not blocked him from being able to go out is by pulling his arm out backwards, out to the side here, through that hole. This can be made difficult for him to do by bringing my knee up 
blocking here, having his elbow brace against the mat, but I might not have enough time where if I'm trying to dig, he starts to bring this arm out. And then he's going to get back involved into the fight. So, if you feel like you're going to lose this arm, we're going to wait at the finish line and catch him. We know how he has to go out. He can't go up. He can't go out. He can't go down. And so, there's no way for him to go except pulling the arm out. My hand here is going to wait for him. And as his arm comes out, I catch the wrist. And now, I'm in a straight jacket. This hand, I'm going to switch to having my thumb gripped over. So right now I had no thumb, like this, the praying mantis or a bear palm. I'm going to switch the thumb to here so that I can start creating a strong push. I'm going to have my fingers wrapped around like the divots of his wrist. And now, this gives me some rotational, lever-based rotational control of his body. Because, because I have both wrists, if he tried to turn, say, to his left right now, he can't because of this arm. If he tried to turn to his right right now, he can't because of this arm. But if I only had one other control, obviously, if he wanted to turn into me this way, he can't. So this stops him from being able to turn to his left and right. So we got our uh, rotational control covered. The great thing about the straight jacket is it gives us the strength to be able to, a great angle to push the hand down so that we're going to be able to start looking at trapping the arm with our leg. That will be in the next video. So, just really important to know that as we're here, we've got the double motorcycle control. Here and here, I finish a lot of people right at this stage. But against better guys, guys who are really good working with their chin, I'm not going to have enough time. And as that arm starts to come out, if I wait too long, well, I might be able to get something going here, but it might be difficult. As this arm's slipping out, don't get greedy. Understand that it's, well, I just got to make one more play here. Catch it. Now I've got the straight jacket. From here, he's going to try and defend. It's very difficult. I have a lot more manipulation with his arms that's going to set us up for the next line of attack. So make sure you watch Back Control Basics to understand the first bit of that. That will cover you 90% of the way. This is just another stage on top of that. If they're able to defend the straight jacket, then they still have to go to block in the killing hand, and you're going to be able to just keep cycling this attack over and over again. And I'm going to show you guys how to trap the arm with your leg from back control in the next video. Okay, getting into trapping our opponent's arm with our leg from back control. I'm gonna show you guys the straight jacket first, which is the best way of doing it. One of the best ways, because we obviously just covered some of the grip fighting in the last video. And then I'm gonna show you guys just uh, something I use a lot that uh, Henry Gracie actually teaches of just threatening the choke and then using the energy that your opponent gives you to be able to trap the arm. I'm going to show you guys how to properly position your leg to trap the arm because that's something that I had a lot of problems with. So, the straight jacket is great because it gives me the cross push here where my left arm is able to push across Kevin's body pushing his right arm down. If I try to push Kevin from here, it's hard for me to get placement of a really good angle to create a really strong push and also being able to create a push where he go, his elbow creates... Uh, uh, open elbow pushing it outwards so I can trap it with the leg. My elbow also tends to have to open from here and I have a hard time either I open my elbow to try and increase my pressure of being able to utilize my back a bit but I become weaker or I'm trying to do just a tricep press down here and that's not a strong motion. However, across the body I can close my elbow and have a really strong push. So from here what I'm looking at doing is Freeing this leg up, so typically you want to have this leg at least across the hip here so I have some cross body rotational control to make sure that he's unable to get here. If I can do it from, you can do it from having this leg here, but just understand that it can be a little bit weaker. This is more secure, so whether you had the body triangle and now we've secured the straight jacket and now we're going to free up, or have this position, foot on the hip, bring the leg across, foot here just like I talked about in back control basics. What I'm looking to do is push his arm down here. Having this grip, I have my index or my uh, middle finger wrapped around into the divot of his wrist and my thumb on the other side. And I'm pushing it down. And what I'm looking at doing is not having my knee out here and using flexibility where you can see how I externally rotate my hip. I'm looking at bringing my knee up over top of his shoulder. And so if you have to, in order to do this, Adjust your hip angle. From here, because of the control I have, and because I have his hip here, I can kind of scoop myself down so that I'm going to have a little bit more of a disconnect here where his 
shoulder blades are actually going to be a little bit lower down on my ribs rather than chest here because my head's right next to his head. It can be difficult to bring my leg up like this. But if I'm here, it's much easier for me to bring my crook of my knee up over top of his shoulder. And from here, I'm looking to just bring my foot, my heel up closest to the wrist as possible. You can do this sometimes just down here at the crook of the elbow pushing into his forearm, but obviously the lever control becomes weaker and I'm only able to do this because my leg can overpower Kevin's arm. And it's also gonna be harder for me to bring his, leg, his arm all the way back so I can trap it effectively. Use this wrist to push it out and guide it. If he's keeping his elbow in really tight, that doesn't matter. We're pushing the wrist out here. I can take this arm and I can create a pull across his body like this to help break his posture, make him weaker. So I can push this out, bring this leg up and catch it down at the wrist. You can weave it through if you had all the space, you have the length and the flexibility. Otherwise, foot to the wrist and look to create a pressure where I'm gonna be pushing against his wrist before I let go of his hand so there's tension here. So then I'm able to take it behind him. If I place my hand, my foot on top of his wrist and I don't have any pressure here, once I let go of this control, I'm just gonna weave it back inside and I've lost everything. So here, Creating this strong angle, locking my arm out, knee up over his shoulder, catch down at the wrist. I, I pull his wrist into my foot and I push my foot into his wrist. And now from here, I let go, sliding it off out of my fingers. And I bring my foot behind the small of his back. So this is where people make mistakes. And sometimes we don't have the room to do it. Any kind of trapping of his arm is gonna be useful, but Anything that involves me, like having my feet crossed and stuff like this, there's going to be always some space here. And what we see a lot is that people are able to bring their arms back inside. What we're looking at doing is once we've trapped, so I've adjusted my angle here, once I've started to trap his arm, I'm bringing my foot down behind the small of his back by his hips. And so now this foot just curls up against his hips here and I close my knee, and look how there's absolutely no space, no room for him to be able to go anywhere. This is gonna make it more effective now for me to be able to hold this longer and be able to finish him. If I'm here, or here, even like this on his hip, look how there's that space for him to slide through. So, hook the leg, close like this, have your shin right against his ribs the whole way, nowhere for him to be able to go, then we start working for our chokes with the key or for the rear naked. Another option, I can still do this against black belts, but it's not as successful, is just going for the choke. And by going for the choke, this invokes the response of this arm. He has to respect it. He has to be constantly pulling, because if he's not pulling, well, I'm just gonna finish the choke. As he pulls, he's creating force this direction. Now I'm just gonna use that against him. So as he creates this pull, it's a real threat. I extend my arm outwards with it. I just let him go and I push to accelerate it and I trap his arm. I can throw my leg over. I'm turning my hand down, thumb down, hand out, and I'm looking to catch here, creating a wall so it's not so easy for him to be able to get his arm back. And I throw my leg over top. And I can even throw it over top of my own arm because it's going to be easy for me to, with my thumb pointing this direction, Bring it out. So I don't care. I'll even trap my own arm at first as I then extract it. Very good guys that know this are going to kind of react differently by pulling downwards and not exaggerating pulling outwards too much. That's going to be making it more complicated. But a good choke, a good first attempt is like this good jab in boxing where I'm really going for it. It's a threat. He has to respect it. He is pulling hard. I trap it and my leg comes behind the small of his back, I close here, and now I start working on getting back into finishing my choke. So, doesn't work against savvy guys, especially in the first round where you might get him with the first one, and then the second one he's gonna be savvy to it. The straight jacket is a much more systematic way of being able to force somebody into it, regardless of how much they know about the position and what your intent is. But, I mean, honestly, I use that, the, the, the latter one, a lot still. There's no risk to it. You're just going for the choke, and then you're trying to extend them out to throw the leg over. So, trap the arm with the leg. It's what I prefer doing because some guys are so good at being able to defend the back forever. In order to choke them, 
using our motorcycle grip to take one arm out of the equation, utilizing our leg to take the other arm out of the equation, so that now it's just our arm versus their chin defense. That's, that is typically how I manage to submit brown and black belts at higher levels because everyone's defense is just too good against back control. Everyone knows how to do this stuff at a very basic and early level. So hope you guys enjoy that and I hope you're able to make some use out of it. So for our last technique video, I'm just gonna go over how to finish the rear naked choke but with one arm. Sometimes when, we're motor, uh, when we got the motorcycle grip with our other arm, either we wanna keep it because of cross body back control or because of how we're positioned, it just makes more sense to be able to get the choke with one arm while we're keeping the control. And it is doable. So, just from a seated up position, what I'm looking at doing is still getting my arm into the exact same position here where my elbow is lined up with Kevin's chin. I need that so that I can get this hand into a strong grip on the back of his scapula. I am looking to take my hands and dig it into his shoulder here the bone, you're going to feel like this notch here where you're able to take your fingers and really grip onto this. You can even do this with the gi, but the problem with the gi is that it's going to start moving around. So even with the gi on, I look to anchor it and dig my fingers into the notch behind his shoulder. I need this so I have an anchor point so I can create a closed circuit because what I'm going to be able to do now is creating a, a rotation cutting across his neck. So this is going to be uh, cutting off the blood but it's also gonna start cutting off his windpipe, uh, the airway, because I'm unable to really close this angle. Uh, it takes a lot of force for me to try and close the traditional way to make it just a blood choke. Digging in, closing my elbow, and now I'm creating a song effect where I'm bringing my elbow back over to his other shoulder, but never letting this hand move an inch. It's anchored here, so my forearm starts to close over top. Where are you feeling that, Kevin? Windpipe. Yeah. So it's going to be a, a, a more vicious one where it's going to be causing some more pain here, but I'm going to be, as we talked about in back control basics, breathing slowly, incrementally, increasing my pressure, and I'm keeping my head super tight here. I'm not out like this. My head is right beside him. I can dig my chin in. I can't allow any movement because I don't have as much force that I can generate. So if I have force bleeding out anywhere, if there are any holes in my control and in my choke mechanics, I'm not going to be successful. From the weak side, whether I got like body triangle or so I'm here, I got the straight jack control. I managed to trap his, uh, his arm with my leg. When going for the choke, I might have to try and adjust myself down because if I pulled myself up too much here, look how low his head is to mine. So I'm going to look to bring my shoulder back behind his neck so that my ear is to his ear. And now from here, look how both of his arms are trapped. So he's gonna try and defend this. It's just against his chin. I dig this in. I get this on the back of his scapula here, digging it into the bone. You can even do this one arm with your own gi in the gi here, where I'm gripping, I'm gonna close the elbow and I'm gonna to look to drive. I'm driving my shoulder and my head forward to create the backstop behind his neck and my forearm is cutting off the one side of his neck, bicep cutting off the other side. Here and here, pushing in, closing. If we're looking at the Khabib, as we talked about earlier. As I pull in Kevin's elbow and I look to flatten him out, and he starts posting his hand on the mat, this arm is trapped kind of underneath his ribs, my left arm with that motorcycle grip. So from here, it makes a lot of sense for me to just get this grip, keep this post behind him, and then just keep driving in and finishing this with one arm, rather than performing a hip shovel or a chair sit, getting him to the side, and getting right in to the full-on rear naked choke. That might be necessary. I sometimes, like against my instructor, Rob Bernanke, I... Uh, I don't even remember the last time I finished him with a one-arm or a naked choke because he's so good at defending. But I set it up, I get that grip, and then as I have that grip, I will then adjust from that position. So that's something that's really important just from a control aspect. That if I was looking at weak side, I still will trap the arm however I trap it. So I'm digging for the choke, he's gripping, defending the choke. I punch it out, I trap it, I beat him here. I get this grip deep on his scapula, and then from here, I can't 
finish him with one arm. He's just eating this thing or he's able to just kind of shift the angle just enough. From here, what I'm going to look to do, because I already had this arm beaten, I can either look to try and keep this and pull him to this side or see how his arm is still just trapped here. I still have that rotational control and finish him from here. Or I recognize that the job's done and I'm 98% of the way there and I don't care about his arm really getting free at this point because he can't successfully reach back really with that arm too much. And so I might lose that control purposely so I can bring my foot here to adjust the angle to get him back so that then I can finish with the traditional rear naked choke. So practice it, it'll be highly effective. We're even seeing guys like uh, Gordon Ryan and Kane Cornelius finish black belts at a high level with just the one arm rear naked choke. Very strong because it's indefensible. You're just attacking the bare neck once you've taken the arms out of the equation. If not, get the grip, get all the work done, and then just adjust yourself to the strong side so you're able to get that arm out to create the closed circuit and utilize both your arms to finish the choke. So I hope you guys enjoyed this instructional on advanced back control. It was a bit of a struggle to figure out the, the best things to represent within uh, this higher level back control within our one hour time limit. Uh, but thank you Gold BGJ for giving me the opportunity to do this instructional with you guys. And thank you as always to Kevin for donating his time to help me with this. Lever based rotational control is very strong but it has some nuances to work out and it takes a little bit more work. It's why it's the advanced back control instructional. So don't get discouraged if you have some troubles with it, just keep working on it. If you have questions, then uh, hit me up in the comments that, uh, down below in any of those videos. However, this uh, website is structured, but I know I'll, I'll have a connection to you guys or obviously message me on Facebook or YouTube or Instagram to ask me uh, more specifics or some of the problems that you're having with this uh, instructional or any of the techniques. Just remember, direct rotational control, that standard chest to back connection is always a safe bet. It's where you should really start with and you should have an understanding of those techniques before trying this. So don't try and jump into this before going through my first instructional. And understand that if the levers start to fail at any point, then you can always go back to your basic seatbelt. So if I had this motorcycle control of any kind of way and Kevin's managing to punch his arm out and I'm like holy crap I'm not just here and I've lost this if I'm losing the control back to the old seatbelt go to old faithful that control and all the stuff that you would have worked on from uh, the prior instructional is going to be a very strong uh, control to fall back to it's very important to supplement the two back and forth you never ever want to have just lever based control and no direct control or have direct rotational control and no lever based control you want to have both so that you're going to have a fully fleshed out game. So the seatbelt control works really well for the strong side, super important for that. Cross body back control and utilizing that motorcycle grip is extremely important for making your weak side stronger. And so if you have that, you're no longer going to be uh, having a hole in your game where you have to have one side or the other. Yes, you can choose the side a lot of the time because it's back control and you get to choose how you're going to fight that position. but by having this, you're gonna have more variety and you're gonna have the ability to mix up your attacks to create more vulnerability in your opponent. And you might be like some of us that have the weak side for life kind of model where you prefer attacking on that side due to some of the openness of the position and the variance of attacks that you're able to throw in when you start adding in Kimura's and armbars. So I hope you guys enjoyed this instructional and uh, I'll see you guys in the next one.